It's myself, Katie Jones, and... Uh, and Jean-Marc. And Jean-Marc. Bonsoir. <laughs> Bonsoir. <laughs> and uh, we've got quite a lot to get through this evening in our 30-minute session. So, but what we thought we'd start with is a nice glass of red Fitu. So that's the wine that we have open. Has anybody got the Fitu? And if not, have you got a glass of something? Oh, I can see Lagar, James. Well done. Got Lagar. Yeah, Dave, that looks like could be feed. Yep, I got that too. So yeah, me and Mr. Jones as well. So what we thought to get you in the mood is uh, let's just have a quick look and a quick, quick description on the Lagar Fitu. So here we go. Now, for those of you that have done this before, we look just for four categories uh, of flavors when we're tasting a wine. So we look for fruit, floral, spice, and herbs. So let's have a look on this. Uh, firstly, the color, I mean, look at that. It's just so dark and dense. You, can, you can't actually see through it. It's black, really dark color. So this is the Fitu, Lagar Fitu. Take a smell, a little smell, then let's get some air in. And it's so important to decant these wines. Uh, the Lagar range, they, they're big full body styles of wines and they really do benefit from being aerated. So either in a decanter or if not just, if you might have one of the special uh, air racers from Naked or just tip it into a jug and tip it back into the bottle again but that's let's have a lovely mm, mm. so got air into it really makes the flavors come out so fruit floral spice and herbs what are you getting Jean-Marc yeah. no, intense mm. very intense intense like black fruit so I'm getting black currant <clears throat> blackberries bit spicy, so a bit of pepper on the nose as well. What about figs? Yeah, is... Figs. <coughs> or Jean-Marc's favourite, are you getting prunes? Oh, yeah, pruneaux, plutôt. Pruneaux, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so prunes as well. And we're getting that lovely spice, a hint of spice pepper and also the lovely herbs from the garrigue so the rosemary and the thyme if you've never experienced the garrigue it's basically the natural landscape we have down here it's full of rosemary it's full of thyme and you can actually pick up those wonderful flavors on the nose and on the palate as well and if you're thinking food as well what would this go with if you've got a wild boar in the freezer, it's great with wild boar stew. That's what the locals would drink it with. If not, anything like game, or uh, you could have roast lamb. If you put rosemary and thyme on the roast lamb, absolutely delicious. Um, goose uh, is another one. I don't know why I'm thinking goose. Christmas is over. Oh, or a steak. Steak yeah. and chip, absolutely yeah. delicious. Yeah, Phil, you're on for the steak mm. and chips with Jean-Marc. But so I hope that sort of brought you down into the south of France. And really, both myself and Jean-Marc, we both wanted to thank everybody. We were so honoured to have made it to the last three uh, winemakers of the year. Um, just to be in the top three with Stefano and Nina, it was a really big honour for myself. And uh, this year wasn't for me, but... The most exciting thing is that we actually get to make our dream wine. So we're really, really pleased about that. And we, we just basically want to make you something really, really special. But we also want you to be part of that journey as well. We want you to, to help us and feel like you've actually been with us on the journey to make the wine. So our very special wine is going to be called uh, sunshine after rain. Now, I think my mum and dad are here from Ashby de la Zouche, and it was actually the reason that we're calling it sunshine after rain is that my mum, um, I don't know how many of you know the story about when I lost my wine to vandals here in Tuchon, and I actually had my vats emptied um, back in 2013. Mm -hmm. 13, yeah. And we were just totally devastated and um, I remember phoning my mum and she said don't worry Katie 
there's always sunshine after rain. And at the time, we could only really see the rain. And now looking back on it, we know what the, sh the sunshine was. The sunshine was all of you and the sunshine was naked because it was thanks to that awful act of vandalism that we actually started working with naked. So a very special phrase, um, sunshine after rain. And I just felt that today we could all do with a bit more sunshine. And so we really want to make you a wine that is going to add a bit of sunshine and Southern France into your lives at the moment, because there will be sunshine after rain. So there's lots of me talking this evening, but as we go on, you'll see that we're gonna have lots more Zooms and chances for you to, to join in and to visit the vineyards. But so what are we going to make? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, we want to do something rather special. And um, what we do that is rather special down here in Touchon is that we work with old vines. So for us, it just had to come from some old vines. But we wanted to do something novel and something that probably hasn't been done for years and years. And so we wanted to look back at the original recipe for Fitu. So Fitu is an Appalachian wine. That means that it has um, rules and regulations that you have to abide by. And it was created right back in 1948. It was the first red wine Appalachian from down here. But the rules have really changed since 1948. And especially concerning the different grape varieties that you can use. And so our sunshine after rain wine we want to make is a fitu, but with a difference because we want to use that original recipe from the 1948 Appalachian rules. And that means it's going to be 75% red grapes, so Carignan and Grenache. These grow particularly well down here, especially old vines. And then it's going to be 25% of a white grape. So back in 1948, you were allowed to add macabre, muscat, terre, terre malvoisie. Ah. Alors, il y avait le sanso, mais qui est rouge. Le sanso, c'est vrai. Il y en a les 25%. In the 25%. So you were ah. actually allowed to <coughs> add 25% of a white grape into the red grapes. And we just thought, wouldn't that be fascinating to do that again? And Yes, it's about like in Côte du Rhône, in like in uh, Côte Rôti or Hermitage or Saint Joseph, or you can use uh, Marsan, Roussan or Vionnier. And here the idea is to do something uh, with the first variety in the Fitu. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Miles away. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, following on from delicious wines that can be made in the in the Cote de Rhone, where they actually mix the Viognier with the Syrah. So we're going to do the same sort of thing. We're going to, when we say mix, you can't actually make the red wine and make the white wine, then mix it together. You have to co-ferment the grapes. So we'll actually be picking and mixing those grapes when we ferment. So they will be mixed in the tank. Mm. So who knows? Uh, very excited. Uh, on veut reprendre l'idée de, mm. de l'appellation originale, mais avec des technologies modernes. Yeah, so we want to go back to the original 1948 appellation rules in terms of grapes, but obviously with modern wine taking, modern modern wine making techniques that we have now at the Lagar winery here in Touchon. And you may be thinking, just one more word on the old vines before I show you photos, just why old vines? Aren't old vines past it? Shouldn't you be better with younger vines? No, no, I can see Phil going, no, no, no. Old vines are fantastic. The only problem is they don't produce very many grapes. But what they do produce is so concentrated and so rich and balanced that it makes a far superior style of wine. So the main part of the vines that we will be using are going to be over 80 years old. 
and that means they're not going to be producing that much but it is going to be really really special and I think some of the best grapes in the Languedoc I really think from the old vines especially here it's so a sort of drought climate there's hardly any rain and uh, it means that the old vines their roots go a long way down so they can always get the water and they can always stay fresh and healthy during the growing season they don't dry up at all so very excited about the old vine and our special wine we're going to be making for you angels um but that's not all because we want to join us on the journey, just one last thing before we actually get on the journey, um, is that because we are no longer respecting the rules for fitu, we're funnily enough not allowed to call it a fitu. So it's going to be inspired by fitu from 1948, but we are not allowed to put the, uh, the, the word fitu on there because we're no longer respecting the vines. So um, it'd be quite interesting exactly what we are going to call it, but we shall see. So let's have a look. Now, this is where you can come in over the next month. Um, I'm just going to share the screen to get you down to see exactly the vineyard where I will be, where the heart of this wine will be coming from. So just bear with me. I hope I don't lose you all. If I do, it was a very nice session. So here we go on the share and on the let's play from the start. So hopefully now yep, we're good. thumbs up. Uh, you've got just for those of you who don't know where we're talking to you from this evening and where our vineyards are. We are right down here. I can see people getting their tea towels out already. That is fantastic. <laughs> um, people who don't know what the tea towels are all about. It's another thing you're going to learn when you come and visit my vineyards. So I have these tea towels printed with maps of my vineyard, so you will never get lost. <laughs> and um, so we're right down here um, in the south of France in what is known as the Languedoc Roussillon. So along the way, I'm going to be teaching you about the history of winemaking down here. It's actually the biggest, largest wine area in the whole of France traditionally known for not so good quality wine, but big volumes of it, and now getting better and better and better, a lot thanks to these old vines that, were, uh, that are available in the Languedoc, Roussillon area. So the main towns down here, any of you know Carcassonne, Perpignan, Narbonne, see lots of nodding. I know some of you like Julie and Phil have been down to see us, uh, Dave as well can't see you all this evening but yeah you've been down so it's a tiny little village called Touchon between those three main towns if those towns didn't mean much to you a bit further out we have Toulouse, Montpellier and Barcelona but right down in the bottom corner but this is definitely not the sunny south of, well it is the sunny south of France it's not the glamorous south of France it's actually um one of the poorest rural areas of the south of France. But I will be showing you lots more about that uh, over the coming months. But this is just to show you, this is an aerial shot of the vineyard that we're going to be concentrating on in making this wine. And here you can see the tiny little parcels of, we call them parcels or vineyards of vines to give you an idea you can see the Macabre on the uh, right hand side. How big is the Macabre vineyard, Jean-Marc, or how big is this area? Là, en tout, sur le papier, il y a un hectare, mais il y a un peu moins. Ouais. Un peu moins. Ça, c'est du Yadonner, la première. Oui, je sais. Um, so, all, in all, the vineyard you can see is a hectare, but that includes the Garrigue bit in the middle, the sort of bit with the bushes in the middle. Non, ça n'y a que pas ça. Is, the, oh, the Maca, uh, the no, it doesn't include. Ouais, c'est la périphérie. Ouais. Okay. Okay. And how big is the Macabre? Là, le Macabre, c'est petit, ça fait, je sais pas, juste le Macabre, 10, 15 ans. So that's 10 to 15 R, which is... Et il y a du Macabre mélangé dans le Grenache. Okay, 
So we've got, right, start from the beginning, we've got Macabre on the right hand side. So it's a tiny little parcel of just a couple of rows, really densely planted, the Macabre. Next to that, we have the Carignan. And then just coming up the hill, we have Grenache, and it's also mixed in with some other Macabre as well. So mixed planting in that vineyard. And as you come further up the hill, um, we have some, I didn't like, but we have what I call the hairy Grenache or the Liadona Palette as well. For those of you who do have your tea towels out, uh, this is the vineyard, it's called the Col de la Loz and it's above the tiny village of Pazial. So in the Fitu Appellation. So all of these vineyards classified within the Fitu Appellation. So we are actually classifying Fitu vineyards to make sunshine after rain. And then I did point this out on this little map here, just on the left hand side, you can see it's marked abandoned vineyard. That's not us that abandoned the vineyard. Uh, we feel like we actually saved these other vineyards here. But every year our accountant says they're hardly producing any grapes. Uh, they're not economically viable. And we're like, yeah, but they're so lovely. The wine's delicious. We want to keep them. And so we always have this little fight with our accountant, but with your support this year, um, it means that our little vineyards here are not going to become that abandoned vineyard that is just next door to these here. So again, a massive thank you. And just if you're wondering what it actually looks like in that vineyard. So here's me hugging one of these lovely, I'm gonna say Grenache and Jean-Marc will go, that's not Grenache. Grenache vines <laughs> here. Um, but this is just to show you the lovely scenery that you can come and join in with me and admire and take in on our, I call them vineyard rambles like the others, on our special Naked Wines vineyard rambles. And look at this view right over in the background, you've got the Chateau d'Aguila, which is a Cathar castle from the 11th century. You've got a patchwork of little tiny vines in the valley. And I mean, there's just nothing built up there at all. There's no big industry. It's just open space and lots and lots of sunshine. So over the next couple of months, I will, I, I say I, as in I and Yes, Jean-Marc, uh, we'll be, I'll be holding the camera and Jean-Marc that will be taking you up into this vineyard and we will be showing you all of the seasons um, from now right up to picking, processing the grapes from these vines and beyond that as well. So just to um, whet your appetite a little bit, hopefully on the 5th of March, so that's Friday, this Friday, at 5 p.m. So we've done a nice gentle afternoon stroll. That's 5 p.m. UK time. Uh, we will be out in the vineyard and we will just be walking around it and Jean-Marc will be looking at all of the work that needs doing in these little tiny vineyards. So that's 5th of March. It's going to be on Naked's Instagram page. So I'm going to do a takeover of the Naked Wines UK Instagram page at five o'clock on Friday. And then just to give you an idea of other things, and there may be other things you're thinking, oh yeah, but I want to see that. Let me know. Let me know if there are other things that you want to look at. April, um, I think this is where Jean-Marc perhaps will be building the wild boar fence. Yes, I didn't know <laughs> when, but... <laughs> so, I don't, that's what we looked at, because we just thought that if we want to have grapes by the end of the growing season, this vineyard really needs to be fenced in to protect it against the wild boar. Last year, we lost a lot of grapes up there oh. to the very greedy wild boar. So this year, part of what we'll be doing, and we'll be showing that in April, will be actually building the wild boar fence. And then we start, the leaves will just be coming out. So we'll be starting to powder the vines as well. That's all done by hand. So um, you'll see all the work that goes into it. May, we'll be looking at what we call le travail en vert. So green work in the vineyard. Green work is things like thinning out the shoot, just so we have not too much, not too big 
a yield on the vines. We want to keep it really, really low. Thinning out the shoots, uh, weeding, if anybody fancies a spot of weeding, um, that's gonna have to be done by hand up there as well. In June, we're going to move on to the, uh, the flowering. So the floraison, the flowering. And in July, we're going to move on to when the grapes just gradually change color. So if you haven't ever seen any of this, this will be your opportunity to see it. And because it's done by Instagram Live, uh, it means that you can also ask questions as we go around the vineyard. And if there's things you wanted to know, you can interact with us. If you're not into Instagram, don't worry because we will be doing Zoom sessions as well. So we will be continuing these Zoom sessions so that um, you can ask questions here as well. And we'll just be recapping on what we've done on the lives. And yeah. La floraison et la nouaison. Après, c'est la nouaison, c'est quand le grain est fécondé. Donc, en fait, il y a un moment important yeah. pour savoir si la floraison, si la fleur a tenu. Donc, oh, right. La... So, in between the flowering and the veraison, uh, which is when the grapes turn color, we actually have the graining. I think it's called graining in English, where uh, the little um, flowers turn into little grapes. You'll see that my vocabulary is quite basic when we actually come out into the vineyard, but it will be a graining to see how many grapes. And from that time, we can actually estimate what the yield is going to be. And then August, ripening of the grapes. And September is probably, or end of August, uh, we'll be out there picking, it's all picked by hand. So uh, we'll be out picking the grapes in the cagettes on the Instagram live again, and process, bringing them back to the Lagar winery. And you'll see them being put into the vat. And then in October, you'll see hopefully it all fermenting away, the white grapes with the red grapes. Um, and then November, just to end the year, we'll be out in, to see the autumn vineyard as the um, magic is worked in the winery. And then just to show you what a long process this is, actually making wine, um, we're into 2022 already. So beginning of that year, we'll be looking, well, around about March time, blending of the wine. So again, it's be interesting to show you, bottling the wine as well. And then finally, we'll see it being shipped, hopefully round about, June 22, June 22. So hmm? yeah, it feels like ages away, but this is, I mean, that is how long it takes to make a wine. It's not an overnight sort of um, process. So it'd be great if you're up for following us and just seeing everything that's, uh, that we're doing in the vineyard. So you, by the end of it, what I'm hoping is that you really feel like you've made this wine with us, that you've seen all the different parts in the vineyards, you felt the sweat on your faces when you're weeding by hand, knocking in the poles for the wild boar fences, picking the grapes as well, and early morning there. So that is, we really want to get you involved in that. And uh, so, as I said, just a reminder on this one, Friday, but I think you got the message because I said it enough times already, but Friday, five o'clock, uh, it's an Instagram live on Naked's Instagram page there. Ooh. So we're just back. You describe the process, Katie. Is this going to be organic as well? Yes, yeah. good, yeah. Yes, this is the first year for... It's, that's really exciting as well because um, that's the first year that Domaine Jones has been certified organic. So we've been in conversion for three years and this is going to be the first year. So we have actually been farming organically for three years, if not longer, actually. But this is the first year where we're actually certified. So they will all be farmed organically. And you can see the challenges as well that that, um, that brings and all the, the labor, the increased labor as well uh, out in the vineyard. And I'm, I'm sure because I know people have asked these questions on um, other naked Zoom chats in the past, but um, is it going to be uh, vegan or vegetarian friendly? Yes, it is. It's going to be both. So uh, vegan wine and we'll be explaining why. Like I can see lots of you nodding and those of 
you who have been following my uh, morning vineyard rambles, uh, you know what a vegan wine is because we did a whole session on what is vegan wine, but we will be explaining. People say, well, the wine's vegan, but do you actually know why it's vegan or what makes it vegan, what's taken out or not put in? We'll be looking at that and also vegetarian as well. What makes it a vegetarian wine? So we're really hoping with your input as well and your questions to be able to answer over the course of the next year is it uh almost a year yeah it is uh answer all your questions about wine making how we make the wine and how we grow the grapes as well oh that came to it so i finished on my uh, little presentation of what we'll be doing and i can see what it's 27 minutes past but i think we've got time if anybody has uh, a question at this stage, uh, I think you need to put your hand up and we will try as best we can to answer your questions. Um, Stuart McPherson was very quick on that. I've just asked if you want to unmute Stuart so you can, uh, you should be able to, there you go. Hi Stuart. Hello. Hello. It's a really silly question from, from Wales, okay? Yeah, well done in the rugby. I know. <laughs> Don't mention the rugby. Uh, my wife is from Scotland and I'm oh. from England and my daughter is Scot well, so we don't mention rugby. Okay. Anyway, Sorry. Uh, we do. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a really silly question and forgive me for asking. Is that often you say that when you taste the wine, you you taste pepper and mm. um, strawberries and black currants and raspberries. Um, first question is, is it a surprise to you as to what they taste of? And the second thing is, where, where do these tastes come from? Because if I make an apple crumble, it tastes of apples. Because you put apples in it. You put apples in it. So yeah. where is the pepper and the strawberries yeah. coming from? Okay, good question. Il demande d'où viennent les, les arômes les dans le vin, en fait. <laughs> it is, I mean, it's, it's a simple question, but it's quite a difficult question. Dans le raisin. If you want me to come in and I'll, I'll ask it. So the different flavors, I mean, everything comes for the skins in the red wines and the different flavors that, that we imagine i mean there's not obviously there's not apple in there they're not flavored with anything artificial or at all and we don't add anything so when we say it smells of rosemary or it smells of thyme or figs or prunes they're not actually in there but it's something that will in our minds that we recognize in that wine and it's a way of describing the wine the whole art of wine tasting is to remember those flavors so if you have that wine again you're able to recognize the wine and so it's things that are sort of familiar to yourself and that you pick out in the wine so we can give you a guide um, by saying and this is sort of the general classification by saying yes we can there's hints of pepper perhaps you get a bit of menthol perhaps you get some fruit and in particular figs but there's one thing as well, I think Jean-Marc might be about to say the same thing. Somehow, we always say our grapes, our wines taste of rosemary, thyme, fennel, uh, and those, those um, herbs grow naturally around our vineyards. And okay. somehow, and I don't know how it happens, Stuart, but somehow those flavours find their way. I don't know if it's transferred onto the great it's skins. Sur la, sur la prune, oui. Oh, it is. Um, it's on the, um, on the... Uh, sur la peau des raisins, il y a la prune. Yeah. Qui capte un certain nombre d'aromes. Qui... But it's actually on the great skins. It captures some of those flavors from the rosemary and the thyme, the, the plants that grow around the vineyard. So they can, it has been proved that they can be transferred from the hedgerows over into the onto the grapes and then into the wine but that is a magical thing that is terroir Ooh. so that would be your french answer it's um it's all to do with the terroir 
and oh, oui. <laughs> oh, no, no, a Frenchman saying that's not all of it. <laughs> Il y a les variétés déjà, oh, yeah. variété. Each grape variety has a specific, uh, uh, a different flavor. Uh, there, there's so many different grape varieties in the world that Merlot doesn't smell like a Cabernet Sauvignon, doesn't smell like a Grenache, doesn't smell like a Syrah. And it's just finding a way of identifying these for yourself, even so that you would recognize them again. Perhaps, perhaps rosemary tastes like tastes like grapes. The other perhaps one. it does. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps it's that. Well, yeah. Perhaps I ought to go out and try our rosemary yeah. um, in the morning. Actually, on our, I'm doing a ramble tomorrow. <laughs> so I hope we, in a roundabout way, answered your question, Shira, yeah. on that one. I'll come and test it one day. Come and test it out. Yeah, that would be the easiest way. <laughs> Um, I know it's half past, Katie, but we've actually got two hands up, one from Roy and one from Roger. Do you have time for two more quick questions? Yeah, of course, yes, that would be lovely to hear from Roger um, and Roy. Okay, um, I've asked uh, Roy if he wants to open his microphone. He should be able to unmute himself now. There you go. Good evening, Katie. Good evening, John Mark. Hello, Roy. How are you? Fine, thank you. Yourselves? Yes, we're fine, thank you. Good. Um, we seem to have some good news at the moment with our horrible thing, but um, we won't talk about that. Okay. Um, Katie, will you be able to um, post your presentation with the, the dates and the subjects and maybe some kind of a time scale? I know you can't do time scales for the future because it will depend on the ripening of the grapes, etc. But yeah. just some idea. And then one of the other things, just talking with the... Um, the guy from Wales or listening to the guy from Wales. Um, one of the things I always notice is Shiraz or Syrah, as French call it, I think, definitely has to me a, a peppery and a spicy taste. Mm. I think that's one of the things. Sometimes I don't like it because it's too spicy. Mm. Um, but um, that was one of the things I specifically noticed with grapes. And one of the other things that I'd like to ask is, Will you be considering oaking this wine or will you not oak it? Because I would much prefer it not to be oaked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's take those in order. So um, now I have to remember the first question was the date. So yes, yeah. I'm going to, I, I think what I will do is fix a, uh, a date, the day per month. So every month you will know which day it's going to be on. And then I think if anything happens in between time, we will add them on. So there will be extra ones in between time, just so that uh, we can always remember, for example, it's the first of the month or so, and I will be posting those up. Every time I'm going to do one, I'll post them up on my naked right. wall. Yeah. And also I will put up the full calendar as far as I can, uh, tomorrow as well so you'll well, you'll get that well, yeah thanks because i've got it scribbled out here and it'd be yeah no don't worry that's fine. and uh, also we are recording so if anybody misses these or they want to go back to the other insta lives or you can't make the live then they will also be on the naked site i'll let you know where they will be but you will be able to catch up so okay um, and then, yeah, thanks for the tips for Stuart as well on the what you can smell in the Syrah grape variety. I agree with you. Spicy. I quite like it, but spicy, peppery, but it can be overpowering sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And then the final question on the oak aging. I think we we will be using a very slight, subtle, integrated oak aging on the wine. So it's not going to be heavily oaked. And I was a bit like you when I started making wine, I was like, I don't want oak on it. I much prefer without just the pure fruit. And since then, I have learned that there's oak aging and there's oak aging. And if yeah. oak aging is done well and with the best French oak barrels, you it actually enhances the wine without taking any of that fruit away. And you probably wouldn't even notice that there is oak on the no, wine it's like all your wines that i've drunk i don't feel that any of them are oaked. there you go thank you but i've drunk <laughs> so many australian wines that are yeah, I, over I, oak. not to buy australian because they were well, certainly used to be extremely heavily oaked yeah well that, i can guarantee a lot i guarantee you roy it will not be overly oaked definitely <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much roy thank you questions and um, 
the final question was from Roger. So I've just asked Roger, he should be able to open his microphone now. Yep, I'm here. Hi, Roger. Good to see you. Hi. Um, just a quick follow on comment from the comments earlier about flavours in the, I think that's one of the most wonderful things about drinking wine is it pretty much never tastes of grapes. So yeah, yeah. yeah just about everything else, but not grapes. Um, so my, my question really was with this, using this original recipe for, for the old style Fitu, what's your expectation in terms of how the wine will end up tasting? Will it be like a modern Fitu or will it be like something something else and what else would it be like in your view what's your expectation it, yeah i think it's going to be quite unique um but i think that the macabre so we will be using macabre i gave you the whole list um of the white grapes we can use uh so it'd be carignan grenache and macabre and i think that the macabre is just going to add some finesse to the red, the Carignan and the Grenache. Carignan can be quite tannic uh, mm. by itself. The Grenache helps to smooth that out, but I think that the Macabre is going to help to smooth that even more and just add uh, finesse and freshness in a way to the wine too. So it's still going to be a wine that you can age because we're going to age it in oak. So you'll still get the body in there, but hopefully we'll get more freshness. And um, because we've never done it before. I mean, we're really excited about what it's going to be like, um, but we'll be doing lots of little tanks of it, I think, rather than one big tank, just so that we can mix and blend when we've actually made the wine. When I say different tanks, it will be co-fermented in different tanks, not a red one and a white one. Le macabre est un blanc qui vieillit bien aussi. Oh yeah, that's, yeah. Um, the macabre as well is a, a white variety, but that ages really well. So the macabre is a great variety that you can, well, I do 100% white macabre, and you can lay down that wine for five years, six years, even longer, absolutely no problem. It actually gets better, it gets weightier, it gets heavier uh, as it gets older. So we think it should combine really, really well with the Carignan and the Grenache. And we're really, really excited about being able to do it. Et à l'origine, c'était utilisé parce que les vinifications se faisaient avec les raisins entiers. Mm -hmm. Il y avait beaucoup d'astringence et les blancs amenaient une certaine élégance, une certaine finesse. Yeah. So originally, um, the, the red grapes wouldn't have been de-stalked and it would have been whole bunches. So the macabre was used to add finesse and to smooth those whole bunch vinification around. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to be interesting exciting and we're really looking forward to um a good result with it i know we'll be the only people doing it this way so um fingers crossed it should be fun yeah great um, thank you very much thank we've you. had one late hand if you've got a second for just one final quick question so yeah just absolutely no problem i can see yeah. that's peter um that's yeah peter so i've just peter you should be able to unmute yourself yeah, I can, thanks. Yep, hear me? Yeah, yep. ready when you are. Hi, Peter. Yep. Uh, hi. Um, when you mentioned then you, you're making uh, lots of small tanks, would you be having different percentages uh, of the of the different grape varieties in each tank to give you scope, scope for blending? Is, is that the intention? Yeah. Is that what you meant? That's exactly what I meant to say. Um, yeah, we won't be making macabre in one vat and carrying on the other. We'll be doing different percentages of the different grape varieties in the tanks. So yeah, def thank you for clarifying that. That's... Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, that was all of the hands, Katie. Okay. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for the questions. This was a lot of me talking this evening, um, just to, to sort of get, or well, to explain the principle of it all to you for the next couple of months. And then as we move forward, we'll be doing, so the Instagram lives and more Zooms too. So we have more chances to ask questions. We'll also be doing the quiz as well. So for those of you who enjoy a quiz about the wine uh, in particular, then we will be doing quiz nights as well. So um, I hope, well, we hope to see you on Friday at five o'clock 
on the Instagram live and uh, failing that, if you can't make that, then I will let you know when the next Zoom session is going to be and where you can see the recorded version of the Instagram live. But we'd just like to say a massive thank you um, for voting for us as well and for being with us this evening and hopefully following us all the way through on our wine journey and bringing you some sunshine after the rain. Thanks very much, everybody.